name is Andy Corsini. I'm the Art Promotional Collections Manager in brackets engagement at the um, Museum of London's uh, London Art Promotional Archive and Research Centre. And if no one has if you haven't been to the London Archaeological Archive and Research Centre, um, for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to free to Lark, because I've only got 15 minutes, it's a lot quicker to say that way. Um, and what we do there is we curate all of London's archaeology that's been deposited with us. We make it accessible for any researchers that could be from school, um, private school children, right up to any academic. Um, we have an educational output, so we do outreach, and also part of the education now that we've been into social media. And we have a, a leadership remit. We're the largest archaeological archive in the world. If you don't believe us, go to the Guinness World Records and you can see us there. Um, and having said that, we are part of the Museum of London, but we're actually half of a department, there's one department within that Museum of London. And I often think of the Museum of London as a very large local museum. It's a local museum for London in some respects. And if you've never been to the archive, if we go inside, this is what it looks like. Um, lots and lots of shelves, 10.1 or 10.2 kilometers of shelving, over 200,000 boxes full of archaeology, and if you start counting individual artifacts and objects, there are millions. With that in mind, I think part of my responsibility is to try and get it out there, get those artifacts, artifacts out there so people can start to engage with um, the objects. Going back to 2006, this beautiful piece of Samian, this Roman vessel, with some gladiators on, and if you look in the top left corner, you can see it's got little lead rivets. This was presented to me by one of my volunteers, and most of the work, most of the basic collections care work that takes place in the archive is via volunteers. Um, and she gave it to me saying, how about this for an object of the month? And I thought, why not? So what I did was, at the time, I, um, I googled objects of the month, although this Google was more recently, and I saw that I was competing with almost every other museum out there because every museum has an object of the month. So I thought I'd do another Google search and I did object of the month votes. And then I, at the time, I don't think Stoke Museums did any kind of voting for artifacts. I thought, right, let's try this, this tactic. Let's, let's do something a bit different. And um, R1 is down here at the moment. So it's not great, but as far as I can tell, there are only two museums out there that, as well as having an object of um, the month on their websites are starting to look at ways that you can get members of the public, the <coughs> website um, visitors, to start engaging with our objects of the month. So, um, what do I mean by that? I mean that our volunteers were selecting objects, they're working on collections, coming across very nice things, bringing them up to me and saying, well, let's, let's put this up to, as a possible object of the month. And I'd select three three objects that volunteers have been given to me. Each month I would send an email out with those artifacts in, um, and then they could vote for it using SurveyMonkey. Simple as that. That email went out to about 50 volunteers, and in 2006 when I started, I had less than 10 people engaging and voting. So I thought, right, let's move on to 2007. Um, let's uh, host it on the museums, on our LARC pages and our website, but admittedly, if you've ever been to our lot pages, they're pretty buried within the Museum of London's website. At least in those days, they were very buried. And um, again, although volunteers were accessing this information via email, and there was a web presence, engagement-wise, less than 10 people. Um, having just heard some of the other numbers of engagement, I'm doing very badly at the moment. <laughs> 2008, the museum uh, notices the trend for social media, and we have our blog sites, The Working Life of the Museum of London. Um, I thought, great, now I've got a social platform where I can start posting our pictures, hopefully receive a bit more engagement, hopefully get people voting, and those votes will start to improve. What do we get? Well, we've got the audience, the wider audience, beyond our simple volunteers. There are definitely more people looking at our blog site than there were looking at our actual LARC website. Um, I haven't put a number for engagement because I'm too embarrassed to tell you how many votes we were getting. <laughs> In some, some months, it's actually getting worse than when I was sending them out to emails. <laughs> so I thought, right, um, maybe I should just give up the ghost. But unfortunately, I'm not like that. So I thought, let's, let's, let's give it one more attempt. Let's try, try to think a bit strategically. Um, 
January 2009, our blog site went down, and I thought, great, my first attempt at thinking strategically has failed miserably, I can't use my own web <laughs> um, website, so I, I looked at wetpaint.com, and I don't know if anybody's ever used wetpaint.com, but it's a type of wiki that was it started to be used by different people around 2008-2009, um, and I went to a workshop, and it looked quite good, and I thought people can start loading their own information, commenting on and so I used the platform trial it. Um, I, and votes were coming in via SurveyMonkey. I was using SurveyMonkey at that all. My strategic agenda was really for an internal PR tool because I thought step one should really be trying to engage our own members of staff in the museum. At the museum of London, I think we've got, well, I'm not sure how many members of staff, but probably between 100 to 200 members of staff. And I can tell you that there are some people that work over at the Barbican site, as opposed to our site, Acme, that don't know we exist, that think we're archaeologists, that go out digging rather than archiving archaeology, um, have no idea of when the Romans were around in London, um, and definitely don't have any idea of what kind of artefacts we had within our stores. Our audience then were that, those museum staff, but also our volunteers as well. And the way I approached it was actually to have a proper competitive edge to this. Mm -hmm. So there are three objects each month. One object was sponsored by a volunteer, so they would find an artifact during their work, put that out there. One object was selected by a member of the archive staff, and one, member, and one object was selected by a museum curator. When put it on the website, I deliberately color-coded this, I thought image was an important aspect. I wanted um, the artifacts to be put onto plastazote, so there's a nice background, so the object looked quite good on the website. The bit of information was short, but quite precise, and gave a bit of information about the actual object, also information as to why someone wanted to put this object forward. Um, and also, it's always nice to have museum people um, competing against volunteers. I like to see that aspect as well, that sort of competitive whether the volunteers would then go and say to their friends, right, it's my month, my, my object's up there, I'm up against uh, the medieval curator, let's see if we can beat him. Um, it was interesting as well because I was able to do some special editions. I was able to get ex-members of staff, ex-volunteers to nominate artefacts. Um, some of you may know John Clark, our former curator of medieval collections. It was the year that he retired, was coming up to retirement, so he did a, a special way he got his three favourite medieval artefacts over the course of his 40 year career and that was one of the most popular objects uh, competitions lucky loser month as well and at the time rather than just getting 10 votes I got a few more now I have to tell you all the stats I'm going to show you aren't groundbreaking <laughs> um, it's still very much work in progress but instead of those 10 I was starting to get around the 70, 80 number of, people, uh, number of votes each month. So for me, that was quite good. I thought, some, at least it's, it's definitely got some form of engagement. However, 2009 was that competition on WebPaint, and uh, just as we heard in the last presentation, um, this wasn't done in work time. Originally it was, because I went to get some kind of engagement, but progressively it was taken up more of my work time and it wasn't really the core thing I was meant to be doing at work. To be honest, it was a bit of fun that sort of just scaled off. Um, so I decided to end it on a high, having got my almost 90, 100 votes each month now. Um, and I got some interesting responses from members of staff, why does it have to end? And interestingly, that didn't come from a curator or anybody who's got anything to do with collections of the museum. That came from a member of finance. I thought, oh, member of finance? <laughs> maybe, maybe that's cool. Um, and then volunteer responses, and this is probably my favourite. This seems sad, as it brings a range of items to the audiences. And whether that's true or not, for me that was really good, because at least one person out there thinks that it's going to new audiences, which is surely the whole point of doing this. Um, that person was also, the rest of that email said, um, give it over to me, I'll be happy, I'll happily go and do it myself if you were to advise me. But I thought I'd end it on a high. Um, however, I brought it back, <laughs> and my main role in the archive is to manage the volunteer inclusion programme, the LARP VIP, and during these 10 week projects where we get around 30 volunteers each project, we come across loads of amazing artefacts that were dug up in the 70s and the 80s, 
And I thought it's really our responsibility to, to put these artifacts out there because they're incredible and, and people should be engaged with this kind of uh, information, these, these kind of archives. So I kept some <coughs> ideas that I had with the 2009 version. The colourful backgrounds, the um, volunteers nominating an object each. Um, however, the difference was it sort of extended from that previous uh, wet paint um, competition the difference this one was I could plan it in advance. Because these projects were 10 weeks, I knew that during week one, week two, we found these objects, these were the objects of the week, and then they would form the objects of the competition. So I had a bit more time to plan it, and we could, we could say, rather than the previous programs, it was pretty much whatever came up that month would go forward to a competition. With this one, we could say, right, well, I've got a leather artifact, I've got a ceramic artifact, I have a met metallic artifact. Let's not keep objects that are too similar. Let's try and mix it up a little bit. See if that'll get a different kind of engagement. Mm -hmm. um, also, I was unofficially allowed to do a one-week blog takeover. I say unofficially because at this stage there was no no social media strategy at all for the museum. Anybody could post anything at any time. So um, it just so happened that I said, "I'm doing all these blogs. Um, please don't put any other blogs up during this week. <laughs> um, I want to see how this goes." So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, there was a different competition each day, 16 packs for each day. Um, all nominated by the volunteers. On the Friday, and spreading over the weekend, there was a grand final. Um, and I went, well, all the individual day winners went through to the grand final, and that was, uh, the winner of that one was the best object of the competition. Straightforward stuff. What was really lovely is that we started getting some used comments, and again, these came from volunteers, the current volunteers in the projects, but also volunteers from previous projects. And volunteers that we hadn't heard from for a good couple of years. They sort of been to the archive for a few months, um, disappeared off the radar. Suddenly they were picking, coming back to us about these competitions. Um, and again, staff, including finance, HR, and directorate. Again, another, another uh, memorable, lovely experience. I was walking down the corridor. And one of our directors chased me and said, I voted, I voted. I was like, oh, great. That was all cool. Um, but then obviously, there was a wider engagement with our blog readers as well. Um, just going back to one of my first points, the Museum of London, in my eyes, is a large local museum. And if you have been to the museum, you know that it's on two floors. The top floor is dealing with all uh, history from prehistory right up to the Great Fire, so it's more archaeological. But the ground floor is pretty much social history. So. Archaeology for the Museum of London is only half of the museum. Um, and the blog readers aren't necessarily coming to our blog site to read about archaeology. They might be coming for fashion or, or whatever the situation is. I started using, uh, oh, I had a look at the votes again for the uh, competition voting. The VIP 5689, they're, the they're the volunteer projects that these competitions related to. Um, the first one, VIP 5, didn't do so well, there was a dip. But after that, it was gradually getting better and better for each project. Um, so we sort of plateaued for the last one around the 90, 90, 80, 90 votes per competition, um, which is pretty similar to the previous one, but I was quite happy with that. Then I started looking at my IP addresses, and um, I was actually quite surprised. I knew that I'd have a Museum of London audience, and I knew that members of staff were voting for these artefacts, and obviously they were they're the highest category. I knew that a lot of our volunteers were based in London, so the next one. Then I started seeing that some people were voting from Europe, some people voted from North America. Um, and I thought, that's quite surprising, because seeing that we're only getting around 80 votes, some people out there are voting for it. So, so I found that quite interesting. And um, I should say also, by the last competition, the IP9, which was last year, the museum started tweeting and using Facebook status updates to to try and engage it as well. But it wasn't every competition, it was a bit of a haphazard. Um, so, then we started thinking of what else can we do to engage people with archaeology and archive. And my colleague, Lynn Davis, who works alongside one of the projects, he stole the idea from uh, the British Museum to do History in London in 10 archaeological artefacts. What he does each month is post an object up, but there's much more of a narrative. There's a bit of information about the period of time, some other objects relating to that period of time. And then the object he goes for is an object you may not be expecting. So the object that sums up the Roman period are these uh, 
it fits the requirements of archaeological these grains. Um, and that's an interesting aspect as well. The number of unique web hits that are coming in now to those pages is significantly increased, and it's increasing every month. So we're getting a readership between um, 200 250 now, which is, in my eyes, quite good. You'll see that May has this huge peak. I'll come back to that in a bit. Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. What is that? Um, the other interesting thing is that people are starting to engage this via their own blog sites. So this guy, um, he was put we were ripping off the British Museum, but that's okay, my eyes. Um, <laughs> and and who knows who's reading his his own website? It's also being picked up on Tumblr. Um, again, they're, they're noticing the British Museum's connection, but that's still good. More importantly, that date, that peak was in that last graph, was the 22nd of May. And uh, Mia tweeted this. It got retweeted by William Gibson, so suddenly it had a potential audience of 95,000 people. Um, and that just shows you, just like our previous presentations, the impact Twitter can have on this. Um, and there's that, there's that graph again. So, some responses from the museum. Um, for the Festival of British Archaeology, they did Pot Idol, love a good pun. Each week before the Festival of British Archaeology, they put up a different artifacts, different ceramic, and they, the number of unique kits for this, again, was around the 1900 mark. It kind of fluctuated for each week. Um, despite having this readership, the number of actual votes for the competition, I hope Meryl doesn't want to tell them this, it's 26 votes. Um, so it really went down. I don't know what went wrong, because I thought it was really good. And I thought, and the museum was tweeting about it, Facebook states updates. So something's missing there, and I think that's something that we need to look at as a museum. The final thing I'd like to point out was something we did for the Day of Archaeology 2012. And this again was used in Twitter. Um, basic idea was we've got thousands of shelves in our archive. Somebody could tweet a shelf to us um, and we would take an object or take a box off that shelf and then engage and put up whatever was on that box. Um, for, so it's basically to the people on Twitter generate a number and out it came. Um, this is something I think we should explore more. Just to finish, we now have a new social media strategy at the museum. Um, it integrates use of social media sites, so it's using Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest all together. But my final comment would be, the main reason why we're doing this, and the main reason I think we should be doing this, is because if you have objects, you should be having fun with finds. So, thank you.